trying to figure out who we're missing. We don't have Brett yet. Um, and we don't have Kelly. Oh, Brett is in the waiting room. Um, and then I'm not 100% sure Kelly is coming. They said that they were going to, but they were going to join from a hotel, I think. Oh, did they not have power? And I have to change one setting in our YouTube videos um, and start the recording. Okay, all of our settings are good to go and we're recording. So um, we are still missing one commissioner, but I would say go ahead and start whenever you're ready. All righty. I will now call to order the February 18th meeting of the Salem Historic Landmark Commission. Uh, Zach, will you please call, take roll call? Yes, uh, Commissioner Cottingham. Here. Uh, Commissioner Kurtiman. Here. Commissioner Fuller. Here. Commissioner Mulvihill. Here. Commissioner Ponce. Here. Commissioner Schwartz. Here. Commissioner Thomas. Uh, not here. Uh, Commissioner Zimmerman. Here. And Commissioner French absent as excused. Um, I, technical question because I haven't done I haven't had this happen before, but when a commissioner isn't here and I don't know, do I still say absent excused or just absent? Just absent. I'll get an excuse. Okay. <laughs> um, so um, Commissioner Thomas absent. Awesome, uh, thank you. We have established quorum. Thanks, Zach. Uh, I will now pass it off to Lisa for swearing in of new commissioners. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lisa anderson -Ogilvy. I am the planning administrator this is my first time swearing someone in because normally a city attorney would do it, but it turns out you don't have to have a law degree to do this. And our, our legal counsel could not be here tonight. So we're gonna do it one at a time. Um, Steve, I'll start with you if that's okay. I think we gave you a copy, so it shouldn't be too confusing. I've seen this go really poorly when people read really long sentences and then people get confused. So I'll, I'll do it in pretty short chunks, but um, please raise your right hand. I say your name, do solemnly swear or affirm. I, Stephen Ponce, do solemnly swear and affirm. That I will support the Constitution and laws of the United States of America. That I will support the Constitution and laws of the United States of America. And of the State of Oregon and the City Charter. And the State of Oregon and the City Charter. And ordinances of the City of Salem. And the ordinances of the City of Salem. And that I will, to the best of my ability, and I will, to the best of my ability, faithfully and lawfully perform the duties, faithfully and lawfully perform the duties of a, of a historic landmarks commissioner for Salem, of the duties of a historic landmark, landmarks commissioner of Salem, during my continuance therein, during my continuance therein. Great. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, yes. Um, okay, Brett, it's your turn. All right. All right, I state my name, do solemnly swear or affirm. I'm Brett Fuller, do state my name. <laughs> Excuse me, I, Brett Fuller, do solemnly swear or affirm. <laughs> that I will support the Constitution and laws of the United States of America. That I will support the Constitution and laws of the United States of America. And of the State of Oregon and the City Charter. And of the State of Oregon and the City Charter. And ordinances of the City of Salem. And ordinances of the City of Salem. And that I will best to the best of my ability. And that I will to the best of my ability. Faithfully and lawfully perform the duties. Faithfully and lawfully perform the duties. Of a historic landmarks commissioner for Salem. Of a historic landmarks commissioner for Salem. During my continuance therein. During my continuance therein. Congratulations and welcome. Thank you. Awesome. Well, welcome, uh, Brett and Steve. We're excited to have you guys. Um, 
I've heard a lot about your backgrounds and I think you're going to bring some wonderful uh, diverse perspectives uh, to the to the board from your your different educational and work experience. So very excited uh, to, to have you guys. Uh, with that, we will move to public comment. Um, the commission will now hear testimony from the public concerning items not on the agenda. Is there anyone, uh, Zach, who signed up to speak uh, uh, during this time? No one has signed up and uh, no one has joined. So no members of the public besides those who have been invited to do a presentation. <laughs> Wonderful, perfect. Uh, so with that, we will now consider the approval of the minutes from the January 21st meeting. Uh, may I please have a motion to approve the minutes unless there's any uh, amendments needed? I so move. Do I hear a second? I'll second. Awesome. So Commissioner Zimmerman moves to approve the minutes and Commissioner Cottingham seconds. Um, oops, I jumped ahead. Are there any corrections? Guessing not, because no one made any the first time. Uh, so all in favor of approving the January 21st uh, minutes, please say aye. 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 All opposed, no. Awesome, so hearing no objections, the minutes uh, pass. We do not have any public hearings tonight, which is good. Um, I don't believe we have any action items. That I'm seeing heads on. Um, and so with that, we will move into our discussion items. Uh, I will pass it on uh, to Kimberly to introduce Kim. So thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Um, we're very excited to have uh, Kimberly Moreland with us tonight. She's uh, representing the Oregon Black Pioneers and here to help us celebrate um, African American and Black History Month. And Kim, just a little bit about her. She's a, a dear friend and used to work with um, Lisa and I at the city of Salem and Eunice, who's here tonight. And um, she has um, worked as an urban planner for the city of Tacoma, city of Salem, city of Portland and Portland, um, or I'm sorry, uh, Prosper Portland. <laughs> and also uh, is currently the owner of Moreland Resource Consulting. And so we're very excited to have her here tonight and look forward to seeing her presentation. Thank you, Kimberly. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to come and present. And tonight, I'm going to give you a brief overview of Black history in Oregon, but with an emphasis on preservation of historic places. And um, this is something that I kind of led um, the kind of initiative with the Oregon Black Pioneers. And um, I'm really looking forward to sharing this, this history with you. And so I'm gonna share my screen. Let's see. Oh, here we go. Um, a little bit about the Oregon Black Pioneers. We were founded in um, 1993 and incorporated in 1994 in Salem, Oregon. Um, the mission of the Oregon Black Pioneers is, in a nutshell, is simply to educate everyone about Oregon Black history. And we do that in several ways through exhibits. And we actually have three expeditions going on in um, various parts of Oregon. Uh, and you can check out our website at www.oregonblackpioneer um, to find out more about those expeditions. We have two publications. One is called Post of Bearings, which talks about the history of Million County and Polk County. And then the other one is a document that I wrote on behalf of the Oregon Black Pioneer that talks about the images of America, African Americans, <clears throat> um, history of Portland. And Kimberly was actually the one who kind of inspired me to write um, that book and, and to um, convert my previous history into that um, Arcadia publishing format. Um, and um, we also have presentations like this one. We, we, have, um, we had a couple of bus, bus tours that we would like to, to um, to, to the, who began to do those again. And, and we're um, doing some really exciting things. We were um, a, an all volunteer organization until 2020 when we hired Zachary um, Stock, 
who is our first executive director. And we're just so pleased with him and the work that he's doing on behalf of the Oregon Black Pioneers. I want to kind of briefly start um, to talk about Oregon Black history. Um, a lot of people really don't know that Oregon Black history really goes back to almost 450 years when um, explorers visit what would become Oregon as um, expeditions. And on those ships was oftentimes Black um, or African um, people um, in, um, look at my notes. <laughs> Um, Captain Frank Francis Drake arrived in the area in as early as 18, I mean, as early as 1579, and his crew included two black males and two black females. Um, comments was made by Spanish explorer um, Esteban Martinez in 1783 in regards to the makeup of his crew, which was very multicultural. He had um, there was a ne Negro, Indians, or mulatto that was part of his crew and very few of them was, of, of, um, was born in Spain. Lady Washington, which is pictured here, uh, arrived in um, Oregon and left Boston in October 1788 and on a trading voyage to the west coast of North America. And his crew considered a dozen men and one of them was a West African named Marcus Lopez. And he, <clears throat> In, 18, in August of 1788, they stopped at Tillamook Bay. And unfortunately, there was an incident between Marcus Lopez and Native American um, that led to his death. And um, this history was documented on a beaver, a beaver board, but it was, didn't include Marcus Lopez's name. And when there was a, a storm and the sign blew over, um, Gwen Carr, who was a former board member of the Oregon Black Pioneers, took this opportunity to make sure that the narrative would include Marcus Lopez's name. Um, we, no one knows what happened to his body, or but his his um, but he is one of the first person of African descent to be documented in Oregon. And I would just want to say briefly too that. As I talk about, you know, African places or black places, um, the more than just building, it's, it's also um, statue, murals, um, and beaver boys like the one I mentioned before. At the Oregon Territory, what would become Oregon, um, would begin to really um, attract uh, people to this area. York became another one who was the first documented African to be in what would become Portland, and he was part of the Lewis and Clark Discovery Court. And um, his presence was significant throughout the Discovery Court. He was a great hunter. He had um, great relationship with some of the indigenous people in the area, and um, and he was a, a man servant for um, William Clark and. And when they re returned, unfortunately, to Kentucky, he lost the rights that he had with the Dis Discovery Corp, and he remained enslaved until um, 1811. There was a series of exclusion laws that really impacted um, the Black migration to Oregon, and they really started um, in an incident that took place near Oregon City. And you, you, got, you know that Oregon City was established by the Hudson Bay um, Company in 1829, and it became Oregon's first city in 1844. And, um, and there was an uh, African American who was living in that area at that time. His name was James D. Saul. And he actually um, was part of a, a, a ship called the Peacock that was shipwrecked at the Oregon coast. And they, um, um, over, over time, they uh, were able to purchase another ship called the Oregon. And at that time, he deserted 
um, <laughs> the, the ship and he remained in Oregon City with another uh, African-American. And that was common during that time, um, mainly because uh, the Oregon ship was returning to New York and now he would be met with you know, enslavement, slavery, you know, and so it just was a new territory and it was very multi-ethnic at, um, at the time where you had Native Americans and, um, and also others who had um, came by ship and, and settled in the area. But, and there was an incident between, there were two in, incidents between Shaw and a guy named Whitlow, who was a, another uh, African-American of mixed her heritage over a, a saddle of a horse. And um, um, Winslow sold him a, a horse that was owned by, that was promised to a Native American named Costa. And it became a battle. And, um, and there was um, a white officer was killed as a, as a result of this incident. And then there was another incident between James D. Saw and Pickett. And Pickett was a white settler that no one really cared for, but he, but he um, incited um, of the fear of a Native American and Afri African American collaboration. And, um, and that incident um, created a rise of exclusion laws. And uh, those two incidents. So, and and James D. Saw and James Pickett, um, the main issue was Saw's support of Native rights, and so and that um, provided Pickett with more support of potential collaboration with Native Americans and Africans. And so when they created the Organic Code of 1843, there were um, provisions in there that included uh, limited uh, citizenship for that only for free descendants of white, white of, of a white man who resided in the territory and also to establish the land donation of 640 acres. And this um, organic code was also the framework for the provincial government laws. And that, those laws were heck, um, included Oregon's first black exclusion laws later known as the last law. And that was created by a man named Peter Barnett. And he um, put in language in the Oregon exclusion laws that declared slavery illegal, but black people and all mulattoes, um, which is a term for mixed race, had to leave Oregon. And if not, they would receive several lashes. Applegate, um, Jesse Applegate came and would, became a part of the um, executive committee that would govern this provisional government. And he reversed those exclusion laws and he repealed the last law. So there was a period of time when um, uh, black exclusion laws was not um, enforced or was no longer on the books. But as more as the migration of, of um, Southerners and, um, and the development of territorial laws, those exclusion laws was passed and forbidding blacks and mulattoes from settling in the new, newly declared territory. A lot of those uh, attitudes came from Southerners who, um, who resented the economic system that undergirded slavery, but they also did not want uh, to have the same rights as free blacks or, or have they didn't want free black to have the same rights that they had. And so in, 19, in 1857, voters approved a, a black exclusion clause as part of the proposed Oregon constitution. And in, on February 14, 1859, the, the state of Oregon was the only um, union admitted into the 
only in state admitted into the union that had exclusion laws, and those exclusion laws were on the books until 1926. And as you can see um, from 1850 to 1860, there's a significant growth of non-Black Oregon population. And, and Oregon's Black population you know, actually tri almost triples. And that's because enslaved Africans came across the Oregon Trail with the slave owners. And some of them were given their freedom when they got here, others were not. And, um, and many of them were living in very rural areas where um, they could hide and, and um, not be subject to the exclusion law. And over 500,000 people came across the Oregon Trail. And this is um, the three trails. And, um, and many of those did bring um, the enslaved Africans. And some of them, and this is one who came across, he was born into slavery, but, but when he came across the Oregon Trail, he was with his adopted white parents. And, and um, but because of the anti-Black and, and the exclusion laws, he settled um, near the mouth of the Columbia River in the Vancouver area and eventually headed north um, where he became the founder of Centralia. And this is a map of his journey across the, what they call the Overland. <laughs> and, but not everybody came and left. This is a map that Oregon Black Pioneers um, created to show that there was a significant population of African Americans that settled in the Willamette Valley and throughout the, in the various counties of Oregon. And um, to your right, this is um, a community that um, was a logging community in Wallawa County. You had Joyce Fletcher, who was a black cowboy who was a rodeo star in Pendleton and was um, celebrated during the second um, Pendleton Roundup. Um, this is Mary Jane Holmes, who was at the center of the lawsuit when, she, when her mom and dad sued for their children from their former slave owner. And, and it, the stories go on and on. And this is a Marion County couple, America Spogo and Richard Bogo, who in America, Waldo came across the Oregon Trail with the Waldo family. And she married Richard Bogo. And this couple did leave and establish um, like a legacy in Walla Walla, um, Washington. And Dick Bogo, who was the second city council member for the city of Portland is in their lineage. This is his like great great grandparents, and um, and so another couple who came um, is David and Leticia Carson. And Leticia um, brought her came across the Oregon Trail with her Irish born husband David, and they had a donation land claim in Salt Creek, uh, Oregon which is, I believe, north of Kabbalah and south of Salem. And um, when David died, they take away her land and um, her cattle, and she moved to Douglas County, where she sues um, her neighbor. And she did, she was compensated, and she received, you know, money for the cattle because she had several witnesses who, who, who supported her. And um, she would also receive the donation land claim in Douglas County, which was un, unheard of. And, and um, despite, you know, the exclusion law, there was still, um, um, you know, evidence that they didn't really enforce it. And she received her donation, uh, donation land claim, I believe in 1865. Um, and um, this is another, and I, um, a picture you can't see is Gwen Carr, who was at her, at Leticia Carson's um, some, uh, headstone at her cemetery site. And these are some of the, you know, preservation efforts that we would like to be, you know, involved in. 
Um, and another fascinating story is um, at Abner Sittner and I.B. Francis who came from Philadelphia and they had a dry goods store in 1850. And they settled in Portland at around Front Street, which is now NATO Parkway and Stark. And as soon as they got there, they, uh, a competitor said, hey, you know, they really shouldn't be here, you know, based on the exclusion law, the 1849 exclusion law. And so, um, 112 people uh, petitioned on their behalf to make an exception for them to stay. And, and they won, and they got their exception and they stayed in Portland from like 1850 to 1860. And he, this is a building that he owned, this is from a lithograph of early Portland. And that's the building that he owned. It's now gone, but there's a group called Same Set Society who wants to place a marker at that site, which is now near the um, um, near Morrison Bridge, and and they want to place a marker. If you're waiting for Multnomah County to approve that, and the photo to your left is a picture of an advertisement for the business, and they had a, a dress shop and a dry goods. And the photo to your right is a, a militia in Canada because in, in 1860, a governor who was, um, I think, it, I believe his name was Douglas, uh, Governor Douglas, who um, was recruiting African Americans from California. And Abner Francis would travel back and forth to California. And he became a part of a group who migrated to Victoria, Canada. Um, to support the governor who was of mixed heritage. His mother was a, um, a, a former slave and, um, and his father was Irish. And he, um, and in support of Governor uh, Douglas, they created a militia to defend Canada from the United States in what would be called the Pig War, but it was over um, land and territory. And so he would become, and he also would become the first city council member for Victoria. Another home that um, of an early black settler is the Cora Ann Cox House in Brownsville, which um, was owned by African American women who was um, given several acres of land by her former slave owner, and um, and the house is still standing. And in the house at the bottom, you might all be familiar with Elijah Hannah Gorman house. And this is in Corvallis on Highway 99. And um, it's now a National Historic Landmark. And you can find out more by, you know, if you just type in Elijah and Hannah Gorman. And the, the two parts of the home, the smaller part is was built in 1855 and the, the pitch more modern. Um, portion section of the house was built in 1875. And this is an, an example of an early settlement home. It has one of the few examples of a mud mortar um, fireplace. And um, the couple who owned the house saved it from being a fire department test burn site and have written some wonderful, you know, um, books about the family. And this is, I mentioned uh, America Waddle Bogo and, um, and Richard Bogo. And this is their grandson, um, Dick Bogo, who was a police officer, an anchor man, <laughs> and a city councilor. And this home, I was going to ask you, Kimberly, is it still standing? It's in Salem. And this is the Waddle's farm. And, um, and I, or, or near, maybe outside of Salem. I know there was some effort to save the building and it had significant history to the Bogos. Yeah, I know about the effort. I don't know if it's been successful. It's outside, it's, a, it's not in the city. Okay. But yeah, I know I should find it. <laughs> and um, this is George Flex. I talked about him earlier and he was the black cowboy and there's others. And he also has a cabin, that, but it's on um, a reservation um, in uh, Umatilla um, land. So it's 
is very difficult, but it'd be great to preserve. But he does have a statue in his honor in downtown Pendleton. And he's also been in the Hall of Fame of African-American Cowboys. Um, as you know, as we, the turn of the century, you know, the population of, you know, non-whites increases um, and, Af and also African-Americans are um, increasing as well. And a lot of that is due to the completion of the transcontinental railroad. There's like five rail lines that, that ends in Portland. And, um, and so you, you see this growing community um, this is W.G. Allen, who owns the Golden West Hotel. The building's still standing, and um, and this is good. We're hoping that it would be one of um, be part of the city of Portland's effort to preserve three African American sites. And this is one we're waiting for the the owner, Central City Concern, to give us the permission to include it in the city of Portland's historic preservation program. And then um, these are ladies that were part of. Um, the Oregon Council of Women, they're early suffrage leaders, and we're finding out more and more about them, and we're hoping to preserve, you know, um, and recognize them and honor them for their contribution to the growing Black community at the turn of the century. Um, and this is Harriet Hattie Wetman. She was honored by the Friends of the Lone Fir Cemetery at the celebration of the suffrage movement. And she was one of the leaders in the uh, Oregon suffrage movement. And she also was one of the few African-Americans that was part of that, that movement um, as a leader. And her family had a tremendous history and legacy in Portland. And, um, and I just found out that her house is still standing in Southeast. Um, Portland. And this is the Knoxville Logging Company. Of, and Gwen Trice, who is the executive director of the Knoxville Interpretive Center, is had dis, is disassembled this um, last remaining headquarters of the Knoxville Logging Company. And she's hoping to reassemble and preserve that site. But it's a black logging, an interracial black, an interracial logging community in Portland. And these two sites uh, represent, um, you know, the growing middle class community. And these are two buildings that were built by African American. Um, this is uh, Mount Olivet Church, um, and then to to the left is the uh, it was the colored YWCA. Then it became the William Avenue YWCA. Then it became a, U, a USO. Um, during World War II, and now it's the Billy Webb Elk Lodge, and it was recently added to the National Register of Historic Places when the city of Portland uh, and the National Park Service approved Portland Marshall Property Doc Documentation, MPD, for African American resources. And now we're hoping that effort we could uh, preserve the Mount Olive back. Baptist Church, and this was their second location, but it was built by the congregation, um, and um, and it's also um, uh, has an interesting history with the Ku Klux Klan, who wanted them to move across the river to the east side, so they donated lumber to <laughs> make that happen. And <laughs> I don't know if it's an urban legend, but um, but it's is part of that, the history of the church. But Marcus Garvey spoke there, A. Philip Randolph spoke there, later Cornetta uh, Smith, uh, Martin Luther King, King um, Coretta King spoke there, who is Martin Luther King's wife. They had a tremendous legacy and um, one of the oldest um, buildings on the west side of the Mississippi that was built by African-Americans. So by 1940s, you see a population of 2,500 uh, roughly people of African Americans who are living um, in Oregon. And it's a small community um, that is about, that's about to explode um, because of the city of Vanport 
um, during World, World War II. Um, uh, the city of Vanport, sometimes called Kaiserville, was built to accommodate the, the shipyard building. And Kaiser recruited several African Americans to work in the shipyard. And so you have almost the population swells from 2,500 to 20,000 overnight. And you have a housing, a housing crisis. And so Kaiser quickly built the temporary housing. And it's one of the largest um, housing developments in, in the United States at that time. And it, what you see is um, women being a part of the workforce um, and becoming part of um, the military. To my far left is Eva Poole. She um, was a member of the WAC, which was the Women's Auxiliary Army Corp, which kind of was the um, introduction of women in the army. And she was the uh, representative, she was the first African-American in Oregon to become a part of the WAC. Then you have Nina May Locke in her shipbuilding out outfit as well as her church going outfit. And I included both because it showed the prosperity of the time. And a lot of, you know, their wages really increased when they were working for the shipbuilder as opposed to the limited opportunities they had in the South in low wages. You can't really see, but this is an inter, interracial foundry um, workers. And it was really, um, throughout the shipbuilding, it was really the first time that black and white kind of worked together. You know? And um, and it, a vampire and was very, um, Parts of it was the housing was segregated, but the public facilities were inter, uh, integrated. The schools, the rec centers, the churches. Um, but unfortunately, in May 30th, 1948, there was a flood in Vanport. And um, the flood just devastated the whole city. And there's a few remnants of the city of, of Vanport. And there's um, a group, and I may be part of it, to actively preserve part of the, like the foundation of the theater is still there, and certain, um, a few of the buildings are, are still, uh, the foundation, there's still evidence of, of the hospital, and so it was a, an amazing community that was built overnight, and, but so we are hoping to preserve this site. Um, but as you can see, um, the flood just devastates the city and the, um, Portland has a housing crisis. As, um, uh, most of the people who came to Portland for the shipbuilding, they left, some of them left, but a lot of them stayed. And so the original 2,500 um, African-American now has a population of 11,000. The war ended in 43, 44, but because of limited housing opportunity, African-American, Japanese who came back from the internment, people low income, whites could not, had to, was forced to kind of stay in Vanport and the flood kind of forced them, you know, and forced the city of Portland to deal with the housing crisis. So, during after the war, you see uh, a lot of progress in terms of civil rights, and one of them is the public accommodation law. It took 17 legislative sessions to pass this, and beginning from 1919, almost 34 years, um, for the public accommodation law to pass. And the gentleman right here to your left, he was working on um, passing that law. Um, since um, he moved, since the time he moved to Portland, which was in 1918. And so he was in tears when uh, it finally passed. And you also have the employment law. You see Martin Luther King visit. He's um, supported by local ministers in the area. Um, you, you saw, you know, redevelopment and all, most of them were government sanctioned, you know, government supported redevelopment efforts like 
the Memorial Coliseum. Well, that, that was a separate group, but yeah, you see, but it was supported by government leadership. And during the war, and probably like, I, I would say at the turn of the century, as African Americans start to migrate across the river to the east side of Portland, they settled in this area, which was called the Broadway Track, and it was right in between a steel bridge and a Broadway bridge. And so it was a robust community of African Americans until um, the 50s. But um, the Memorial Coliseum, you know, created, started this investment in the area, and they, and they demolished that community. And you can see the land clearance. And it's, it's really sad when you kind of research in the history because you can see that, you know, have that area been untouched, we would have so many resources, African. <laughs> but um, the leadership um, and advocacy and activism began to change in Portland. It became from the nice ministers to, you know, the very political polished urban league and the NAACC, NAACP um, became a little bit more what they call militant aggressive and the Black Panthers were started. And um, in this photo is the founder of Portland's um, Black Panther Party, Kent Ford. And they had a dental clinic, a medical clinic, and they had a breakfast program for people living in Albina. And here they're having a press conference talking about, you know, probably about police brutality. It was a lot of that going on in the 60s. There's a race riot. And um, and this is uh, Kent Ford, Percy Hampton, and an unidentified um, person. But they, <clears throat> and this is um, Kent Ford and Percy Hampton at one of our exhibits. And they were part of a public program and panel talking about the Black Panther movement in Portland. And, um, you know, as in the 70s, you also have urban renewal and people were protesting, protesting against, you know, the clearance of land that imp impacted African-Americans and other marginalized groups. And here is the, the it was the, the city of Albina Commercial Center, then it, then it became the, uh, the heart of the Black commercial district during the war and after the war. And it has been, this photo, you don't see it, but the dome has been taken off and the building's been torn down. And the dome has now um, been restored and, and it's at Dawson Park. But the area when it was demolished, it was vacant for over 40 years. And so that left an eyesore in the community. And, um, and there's an effort now to, to do redevelop that area, Prosper Portland, um, the city of Portland economic development arm, um, the city of Portland and Legacy Emmanuel are working together with a project work, a citizen, a project working group to redevelop the area into a black cultural center. And um, this is a couple, I, I added them because they received a, a SBA loan through the Model Cities program. So you begin to see people go from like warm poverty funding to model cities funding, and they start to look at wealth creation, entrepreneurship, and this couple became the owners of the first black bakery in the city of Milwaukee. And um, the, they were honored with a mural in Milwaukee as well as this one in the city of Portland. And uh, we're hoping, the Oregon Black Pioneers have been working with them to get a marker on the, on the building that's still standing where they where they operated their bakery. And as you know, they moved forward with, you know, trying to learn from the past. You know, historic preservation to me is also an answer to learn from learning to the past, I'm trying to preserve what remains. And um, and this is again the Hill Black site that I talked about earlier. And up here in the corner is um is now gone. It was part of it was the smallest with the urban renewal, but this was the medical clinic. And the medical uh, clinic attracted doctors from 
from all over Oregon who volunteered um, the services at the medical clinic. Um, this building at the bottom was also the dental clinic for the Black Panthers and it has four Black associations. It was first the office of Dr. Paul Marshall, then it became um, the Black Panthers Dental Clinic, and then it became um, the original office of the Scanner newspaper, and now it's a Black-owned funeral home. And up here <coughs> is um, Dean's Beauty and Barbershop, which has a three-generation business ownership, and it um, one of the sites that the city of Portland is, is going to be moving forward with to to um, put, uh, to do a national nomination, and it was built as, uh, built by African American for a beauty shop. So this is the way that you know this is the building still standing and the family still operating. And um, <clears throat> and this is another site that's still standing, and it was. Um, uh, Ralph Flowers Auto Repair, and Ralph was the son of early Black pioneers. And he, this building is still standing, and it was also converted to the Cotton Club that was owned by Paul Norms. And, um, and this was, now it's not decorative. And I, you know, begged the question about cultural resources. And when you see them, they're not very, you know, ornament, have a lot of ornaments, or, you know, but they have significant cultural history. And um, I'm going backwards. Yeah, I might have duplicate slides. Okay, yeah, I had duplicate slides. slides. But yeah, so that's the end of my presentation. I, I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> and. Um, and, um, thank you so much, Kim. Thank you. <laughs> Can I, I mean, um, that's a, you, you covered a whole lot of information across this date and across time, and I'm, I'm just amazed by it. So I guess I have two questions. Are you able to just share the, the presentation itself so uh, we can share it with folks who uh, weren't able to come tonight? And then um, I know that we shared the link, um, I think in the meeting information with the commissioners, the Oregon Black Pioneers website. And mm -hmm. I don't know if you wanna to just touch very briefly on, you have several exhibits across the yeah. state. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, for more information, you can um, get on our email list uh, so you can receive updates about um, our projects and also receive a, a newsletter. Um, we are having an exhibit in Portland at the Railroad Heritage. It's our old auto board um, um, exhibit. Uh, we also um, have an exhibit at the University of Oregon. It's our, our race to change exhibit which um, was modified to include Eugene's history, civil, ri um, civil rights history, and that's opening at the National Museum, National Resource Museum. Um, and then the third one, I believe it's in um, Benton County, and um, that it's um, it's an exhibit that we received actually from the Oregon State Archive, and it talks about the history of African Americans in Oregon, and and we're really excited too that um, we recently um, we're working with Benton County to get the rights to Peculiar Paradise, which is um, one of the most, pro, I say, prolific uh, history books that deals with Oregon Black history. And so we're in the process of going, you know, creating an agreement for those rights. Also, um, the Eugene Mills Foundry stock task because they wanted to create these. Um, an, a mobile app that runners could use out there running to learn more about different locations. So we're working with them to develop the history for those, those um, uh, various stops at you know, historic places. And so there's a lot going on. We're, a lot, very exciting. 
Yeah, I'm really excited and I'm really, um, you know, recruiting new board members. <laughs> <laughs> I always want to throw that out. You don't have to be African American. <laughs> your, your skills and um, really would love to have a lawyer or <laughs> I'm the board chair, so. <laughs> You're looking at Patty, Patty. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> anyone who's ever interested in writing and <laughs> curriculum so but we're <laughs> no uh i'm really excited about the, the growth of, of the organization well it's wonderful and you, they couldn't have done it without you kim you've been instrumental no oh, thank you and great group of i enjoy working with willie and Gwen Kai. it's pretty amazing yeah, Kim, absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, I would ask if any of the commissioners have uh, any questions um, for Kim, would you be willing to, to take a couple questions if we had them or? Oh, sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a quick question. Yes, Commissioner uh, Fuller. Yes. Uh, 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 Kim, you were talking about um, populations and you were talking about like Oregon in total population and the black population in Oregon. Um, where, where was that concentrated? Is it just like the standard population breakdown where it's mostly in Portland and the surrounding area um, or were there other locations as well of denser population concentration? That's a good question. Um, it started in Willamette Valley, you know, the, and um, it, um, a lot of settlers um, settled in like Marion County, Polk County, in the mid Willamette Valley, um, Benton County. Um, and then at the railroad, um, it became a prominent employment center. It started to migrate to Portland because Portland had five lines that ran through and ended um, in the Albina Yards. And, also at the Union Station. And, and so then, um, you know, you saw this small concentration of African American living near Union Station. The Golden West Hotel provides housing for the porters and the hotel workers, and they bring their families and they migrate east as the, several of the bridges, I mean, most of them, like the Morrison, St. John's, you know, Steel Bridge, Broadway, was all built by 1932. And so you see the east side becoming, you know, a developed area. And, and so African-Americans were concentrated in that Broadway track between the Steel Bridge and Broadway. And, but they, you know, they were really, you know, you had that concentration there, but you also had African-Americans scattered all over Oregon. And a lot of them was living in incorporated areas too. And Southeast, you had the flower, you had a farm and land. You had a, a cluster of African-Americans living on Southeast Tibet. And um, so they, they lived, you know, in a Southeast. And it wasn't a lot of restrictions for African-Americans until 1919, when the real estate, real estate board created these races kind of restrictive code that started to create um, covenant, um, what's it called, restrictive covenants. And, and so um, it kind of <clears throat> stopped, it, it prevented Black from taking advantage of the new suburban communities like Sabin and Irvington and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But, um, and then after the war, the inner Northeast became the hub of the majority of African Americans in Oregon. Uh, you still had communities in Le Grand and Salem, but they were very small. Okay, thank you, thank you. That was, um, yeah, precisely what I was curious about. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Just if you have time for one more, I have a, a question regarding the the family that ran the the dry goods store in Portland. Um, after some period of time, they got an exemption to. Um, Remit, uh, retain the ownership. That must have been a, a huge risk to to develop the property, to become a stable business, and then receive support to keep it. So that was uh, that was an, just shocked me that you know um, the risk that was out there for them to somehow buy the property and 
you know, um, I guess they really didn't, weren't allowed to own it, but they did own it and, um, and then became um, recognized um, owners of it at the exemption process. That's, that's amazing. It was, and I, the building was right next to William L. Lodge um, building. Um, and it, it's gonna be a, a book written about uh, Abner Hunt, Hunt Francis um, c coming out soon. Because it's, it's an amazing story because she um, was friend of Frederick Douglass. And when um, he um, was confronted by that, the competitor, he wrote about it to Fre Frederick Douglass. And then Frederick Douglass wrote about it in his news, new, in his like newspaper called The North Star. So it's like this amazing like back and forth and a disappointment of the Francis family because like, like all of them, they thought they were in search of a decent place, a place where they didn't have to worry about enslavement, or even if you were a free black in the South, when it, it, it was still a huge system that prevented you from, from, from growing, and you know, it was just always there. So they thought that this new territory would give them an opportunity to... Sure. to to fulfill their purpose, you know, and <laughs> raise their families. And, but it, it was a disappointment. And the same thing happened in Victoria too. Eventually, although um, once Governor Douglas was no longer the governor, you know, restrictive, um, the black population was kind of limited. But um, yeah, it's an amazing story. Thank you, appreciate that. Wonderful presentation. Thank you. Awesome. Well, I'm not seeing any more hands or any more unmuting. So yeah, Kim, thank you again for coming and giving this presentation. Um, I'm thrilled um, that you guys, the Oregon Black Pioneers, have been able to get the African American in Portland uh, multiple property document that you mentioned, and even more excited that that uh, effort's going forward for the entire state. Yeah. Uh, that's going to be wonderful to have that statewide context and. Uh, let's let's think of some places in Salem uh, to get some preservation and protection on. I was trying to like the the uh, did you say the boggle the bogey or uh, a, a boggle bogle uh, American waddle bogle the, and it's the, really the waddle phone and also I've been reading a lot about this. Uh, it was called Fat Boys Barbecue. Um, mm -hmm. I I need to see if it's still standing. <laughs> is uh, it was advertised a lot in the Portland Advocate and. He, and um, it's a, his picture and the building, and it, I really- Was that in Salem? Yeah, it was in Salem. Like, I gotta find out where. Yeah. Yes, please, <laughs> yeah. No, it would be great to, to uh, you know, I, I, I think Salem's obviously better than Portland, so I think we need more sites listed. So um, very, yeah. very excited um, about all of those efforts and just the growth your organization has had has been, has been incredible. And thank you for taking some time out of your evening uh, you're welcome. So to, to speak to us, we hope you can come back often and ho hopefully we can keep the partnerships going. And, oh, that's um, awesome. so. and I would love for you guys to meet Zachary and uh, invite him to come. And he's yes, done please do. amazing things in Australia. That's where he lives. And um, so I think it would be, be, it would be great for you guys to meet him. Well, that would be wonderful. Well, thank you again, Kim. Uh, awesome. Please feel free to stay, or if you'd like to go eat dinner. Uh, I'll eat dinner. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't blame you. You mentioned that barbecue, and now I'm yeah, like, yeah, no. going to have a hard time focusing. So, yeah. well, thank you again for coming, and hopefully next year we'll be in person. Uh, so, with that, um, we're going to move on to uh, Eunice Kim to give a presentation on our Salem. Uh, Kimberly, I don't know if you had an introduction, or we'll just jump um, into it. Yeah, Eunice is our our long range. Uh, uh, planning manager and I think she can um, talk about the project. She's been managing the um, update of our Salem area comprehensive plan. So thank you for coming, Eunice. Yeah, thanks for having me. I don't think I can follow that presentation, <laughs> but I'll try. Um, so yeah, I'm Eunice Kim. Thanks for having me. I'm here to present um, some information in terms of the R Salem project and I will share my screen if that's okay. Can you see my screen? It is, yep, there we go. 
Um, so I'm just going to give an overview of the project and kind of where we are. Um, but feel free to let me know if you have questions. Um, either as we go, Kimberly, I don't know how you want to do this. Or at the end, it doesn't matter. I think okay. let's do questions at the end, uh, just because okay. it's hard to see everyone raising okay. hands. So we'll let you take it away. Great. Um, so the R Salem project is, as Kimberly is saying, a multi-year project to update what's known as our comprehensive plan. This is really the large framework um, that guides our future growth and development. It has goals and policies um, and a map that really looks towards the future 20, 30 years. You know, how do we want to grow? Where do we want that growth to occur? And so um, we've all seen a lot of development in the Salem area in recent years. Um, and this is really our opportunity to shape that growth. And so this map is just showing um, the city limits, which is the black ash dashed line. And then the gray area is our portion of the urban growth boundary. So um, the Salem area comprehensive plan is really guiding growth for not just the city limits, but that whole gray area. So it's that area that um, you hear people talking about 60,000 more people by 2035. Um, it's that gray area that we're expecting that growth. So we kicked off um, the visioning portion of this project about a year and a half ago. And we've really been kind of out and about or in and about during the pandemic, trying to talk to people about their priorities um, related to housing and economic development, um, the transportation system, the environment, natural resources, and with Kimberly Historic as well. And so we started that about a year and a half ago. And we're at a really, I think, exciting milestone where we have taken all that information and developed a vision for future growth and development. And we're actually gonna be presenting that to the council on Monday and asking for acceptance um, and essentially kind of the, the nod to keep on working on the project because there's, there's a lot more work to do. Um, but right now we're kind of at that high level goals and then the map and I'll kind of speak a little bit more about that tonight. So we've been doing a lot of outreach um, in the community, both in person and, and virtually. Um, we've relied heavily on different community organizations to make sure we hear the different perspectives um, from people, whether it's our, you know, our business community, our communities of color, our neighborhood associations, um, literally anyone who's willing to talk to us, we have been trying to talk to them to, to make sure we're getting those perspectives. So we've really used all of that input to inform this vision. And so I'll show the, uh, maybe the website later, but we have a project website um, where you can see this document. It's in English and in Spanish. And it, it contains a lot of information about our process, our demographics, um, but, but it really, we're trying to focus on what's the big vision statement for what we want Salem area to be? What are the goals that can help us get there? And then the map, which I'll talk about in a second. So this is the vision statement that we've drafted um, based on all the input. And it really highlights kind of the shared priorities that we've heard throughout the planning process. So you'll see references to equity, livability, um, carbon ne neutral, right? Really protecting our environment, housing affordability, mobility, like how can people safely get around the community, um, businesses. And since the fall, we've added in a reference to really celebrating diversity and culture. That was something that wasn't in our first draft statement. And since then we've heard that that really is a value in the community that we should capture and then our environment. Our goals are very um, big and broad, and you'll notice that I'll walk through some examples. And they're really meant to be um, long-term vision in terms of what we hope to achieve. And then we will be developing more detailed policies that support those goals. We've started some of that work, but we really anticipate getting into those details this spring once we have acceptance, hopefully, from the council. So our goals cover a really broad range of topics, everything from parks and recreation to community engagement, transportation, um, economic development, and I'll show some examples. So we have a community engagement goal um, really focused on how we make our decisions and how we engage the public when we make those decisions. We've heard that it's important that we're really inclusive, um, we're transparent, and we're really collaborative. And this is something that we are trying to um, undertake as we do the project, as well as looking forward in the future as we do more work. Um, we have a goal here of complete neighborhoods, and you may have heard people talking about it. This is really a priority that's been um, consistent in the community since we've started this project, that people really want to be able 
to live in an area and where they can easily walk to meet some of their daily needs, walk to a park, walk to a school, walk to a job, services. And so we've really focused on how can we help create those uh, complete neighborhoods. Um, a new goal, or an, I should say an updated goal, is a goal related to greenhouse gas emissions. Um, our city council adopted a goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions to be carbon neutral by 2050 um, in the fall. And so we have incorporated that into this plan. And then this is a historic goal that I worked on with Kimberly um, about protecting our historic resources and both raising awareness and, and making sure that they are, they're put to use, right? They're not meant to stay still and just not be used forever. So we have some supporting policies as well. So as Kimberly worked and all of you on the historic preservation plan, we've taken those ideas and incorporated them into this goal as well as some draft policy. So moving on to the map, um, we've done a lot of kind of dot voting in the community where we've asked people, where do you want to see a specific type of use or development? Where do you want to see housing, for example? Where do you want to see um, businesses, industry? Um, and so all these different colors of dots um, has, has been a big focus last year. And we've kind of taken that information along with just the general uh, engagement in the community and put together a proposed comprehensive plan map. And so this is the map that really guides where different types of development will occur in the future. And so it's different than zoning, right? Zoning is like very specific to the use um, and the type of development. This is kind of the higher level map. And so hopefully if we get acceptance on the proposed comprehensive plan map at the council, we'll then work on those details of zoning, zoning code, zoning map. But there's basically four big ideas we've heard in the community in terms of future growth and development and I'll kind of quickly walk through them. Um, and these are all kind of reflected in that map. The first is relates to housing. And I'm sorry, you're all squinting, it's very small. Um, we've heard that people wanna see multifamily housing distributed across the community. They don't wanna see concentrations in just one neighborhood versus another. And so you'll see that um, in our map. We're also really trying to focus growth where again, there can be complete neighborhoods and there can be access to transit. So you'll see housing along some of our um, major corridors that have transit access. Um, the other major kind of big idea that we've heard is that there's been continued support to expand where we allow mixed use development. And so that's the pink on the, the second map. And so when we talk about mixed use in, in Salem, we're really talking about flexibility. Um, people want the flexibility to do housing or to do retail or to do office or to do it all together. Um, we have some really vibrant mixed use areas like the downtown, for example, and the North Broadway area. Um, but we're, but it doesn't necessarily have to be that type of mix. It can also just be in this area, there's, you know, housing makes more sense versus um, commercial uses. And the third idea is really related to that complete neighborhoods that I talked about earlier. And this is the idea of a neighborhood hub. We've heard that, um, again, people really want to be able to walk to services in their existing neighborhoods. And a lot of Salem is built out already in terms of single family neighborhoods. And so the idea of a neighborhood hub is to allow small scale businesses, if you can think like a barber or a bookshop or a cafe, kind of in walking distance where, where you already live, that's kind of the idea of the neighborhood hub. So we've really kind of distributed those across the community. And last but not least is employment. Um, we've heard that people really wanna keep our major industries where they are, um, but really, create some flexibility in where commercial uses are allowed and how they're allowed. So we're kind of introducing the idea of more live workspace, for example. So instead of just, um, you know, having everything kind of separate, if, if you want to start a business from your home, um, there's areas where you could easily do that. And it kind of expands upon our current idea of a home occupation. So today you can have an office in your house, but this would expand, for example, to retail. So you could actually sell things out of your house. So we do have an interactive map online where you can put in an address and you can see if there's a proposed change or you can just zoom in and tap on a property and it will say what is the existing designation and what is the future proposed designation and then, and then you can click on that and it will take you to another website that tells you what do we mean by that, what do we mean by mixed use, what do we mean by neighborhood hub. Um, so that's all on our project website and I should have put my name on here as well, I didn't, I apologize, my contact information. Um, so going forward, we are going to present this to the council on Monday and ask for acceptance 
And then there's a lot of more work, there's a lot more work to do in terms of the details. We plan to have focus meetings on different topics this spring. So if you're interested in housing, you're interested in transportation, we will have specific meetings on those topics to really dive into those policies. We'll then be working also on the zoning code and the zoning map. Our goal is to bring it all together as a package through the adoption process by the end of the year. And that's it. Um, I'm happy to answer questions or go into any more detail about um, any of that because I know it was a lot really quickly. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you. I'm sorry, yeah. go ahead, Kimberly. No, no, I just, I just wanted to just um, remind, well, not our new commissioners, but the rest of you, the, we just finished up our historic preservation plan, which I think we did talk a little bit about our Salem as we were going through that. And the, that's a really good model for you to reference. Um, although <laughs> poor Eunice has a much larger area and a, and a much larger scale, but similar to how we did our plan and then our code amendments, that's kind of how this is rolling. So. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Are there any questions uh, for Eunice about what she covered? That was really great. Thank you. Yeah, Commissioner Curtin. And... Hi. Hi. I didn't hear. Um, just wondering how long that has been in development. Yeah, um, the visioning phase has been about a year and a half. Before that, for another year before that, we did some a lot of background work at really understanding like the existing conditions of the community. So maybe we're about two and a half years in. Does that sound right? It's a lot of your work. Wow. Good job. All right, Commissioner Kurtiman. Yeah, thank you. Um, very ambitious plan for this year. I hope you guys are able to get it all together by the end of the year. Um, and it's it's nice to see that the city of Salem is is getting ahead on the growth plan. Um, I know I can speak of a very towards a very biased uh, concern towards cultural resources, um, but it'd be and Salem has done has taken measures to do this sort of thing. But it would be really uh, advantageous for the city to continue uh, to be more proactive than reactive towards cultural resources. And if if we kind of know where a lot of these growths are gonna be happening, um, that kind of proactiveness, looking at areas that we have good support for there to be cultural resources and history um, and taking more of a protective avoidance awareness approach versus a mitigation of damage approach. Um, I know I know a lot of that depends on where the funding's coming from and everything like that. But uh, you know, if one of the goals is to bring awareness and protection towards cultural historic resources and education of Salem's history, uh, that's a great way to go about go about it. Is 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 to be more proactive on examining those areas and learning a bit more about the history. Uh, rather than already having a plan in place and then finding out the history afterwards and having to change the plans. Um, so anyways, I don't know how that would incorporate. I mean, our, our, our uh, you know, historic resource protection plan is, is uh, you know, kind of speaks to that a little bit, but I just wanted to bring that up. Salem, Salem I, I've got to say, Salem has already taken great approaches towards that. Um, a big example is having Kimberly hired <laughs> from the city, like that's huge. So I, I just wanna keep seeing that motivation happening and then also having a very active Landmarks Commission helps too. So thank you, Eunice, for that presentation. That was that was really great. And I look forward to being uh, more active in those things as a, as a public individual. Great, thank you. And, and yes, Kimberly, I would say is on the forefront of all of that work. Um, if anything, we support her on that tour. <laughs> she takes the lead. I will say that we have talked a lot and heard a lot from different communities within Salem that there's really a desire to really um, celebrate um, different cultures in different ways and, and find spaces even, um, whether it's in a hub or in a park or um, where, it can, where they can, where people can really celebrate and um, have a space essentially. So that's something that we've heard throughout this process. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Commissioner Zimmerman. Thank you. Uh, hi, Eunice. Hi. Uh, how's it going? Good. How are you? We used to work together at the newspaper way back when. Uh, 
I was just kind of curious. Um, you were mentioning about the uh, the typing in your address or typing in an address and finding out kind of the future kind of plans for that property or uses. You know, uh, has there been a lot of feedback from folks about that? You know, that they get on there and they say, hey, I didn't expect, you know, my property to be, you know, um, kind of a focus on uh, retail in the future or something like that. What, what, what's kind of been the response from folks when they've, you know, typed in their address or typed in an address of a different uh, location and they said, you know, what, I'm just kind of curious, what, what, what kind of feedback you guys have gotten with that uh, option uh, on that website? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. We did um, send out flyers and mailings to people, anyone who, whose property is even shown as a potential change. And I, I should have clarified that before any of this is actually adopted, there'd be public hearing process and way more notice, but we did reach out um, to property owners specifically. Um, I would say most people have been supportive. I think if anything, we are creating more flexibility in how people can use their land in the future um, with all of the mixed use with the hubs. Um, so, I mean, we've, we've had some concern here and there if like there's an industrial property, for example, and we're saying in the future, we're, we're, we're envisioning mixed use. And so there's been a lot of conversation about how do we ensure that that existing business can remain and expand and still thrive, but have the opportunity in the future to change to a different use. Um, so those are most of the conversations um, where there has been you know, concern, but I would say overall, there's been a lot of support. Um, you know, we'll see when we get to the zoning, right? And the actual adoption, we'll, we'll see, but so far so good. Well, that's great. Thank you. Are there any other questions? I'm seeing heads shaking no and no one taking themselves off mute. So yeah, Eunice, thank you so much for coming and presenting on this. Uh, so the commission knows we did not give her a ton of warning. So thank you for being able to, to do this on the fly. We really appreciate it. Um, it's great. The map, I was pulling it up and it's, I'm not changing. So that's kind of cool. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a really great thing. And we're, I, I'm glad to see that historic is such an integral part of it. And kind of like Commissioner Kurniman said, I think just being proactive about it. And, you know, some of that is not going to be on us as a city and a landmark commission of getting out there and doing survey on things. And so we can know where those areas are to help inform um, decisions. And so, yeah, awesome. Well, thank you so much uh, for coming and uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs> uh, so with that, uh, let's move into, uh, and hopefully these next few things we can fly through guys. Let's do it here. Okay. CLG grant uh, project update. Okay. So forgive me. I should be faster than I am. Um, so you can see my screen. I think everyone asked that. Can you see my screen? <laughs> okay. I think one time I was presenting and I was talking when you couldn't. So um, you have an information report, I hope in your packet that you've seen and the deadline to apply for the 2021-22 uh, um, CLG grant for new commissioners. If you're not sure what that is, uh, Salem is what's called a certified local government. And so because uh, of that, we are eligible for grant funding every other year through the State Historic Preservation Office, which is federal um, pass-through funds. And Salem's been receiving um, grant funds, oh my gosh, forever, I think since the 80s, 90s, is that, is that for a long time. So it's a great, great program. And what you're seeing on the screen is our adopted work plan and um, staff has uh, already received um, approval from the city manager's office. We have certain administrative policies and procedures allowing us to apply for the CLG grant. And so um, we've identified two projects. So under goal one, um, developing some interpretive signage for the Jason Lee site, which as you recall, that was a project we did last year. And then under goal five, um, adding a new category in our residential toolbox uh, a grant program, which we have, have had for a, a while now, uh, which, we're which we're calling the Historic Preservation Green Fund to focus on um, improvements to residential properties to improve um, energy efficiency. So it's an information item. There's no action regard, um, required on your part, but if you have questions, if you have concerns, if you have a different idea, now's the time. So I'm, 
I can stop sharing my screen so you can talk. Yeah, are there any questions uh, for Kimberly about our 2021-22 CLG approach? Awesome. All right. No, it looks good, Kimberly. Thank you for making sure that got turned in on time. Uh, the OPRD grant system is not the easiest thing to use. So also congrats on navigating that. Thank you to Zach for that. <laughs> Thank you to Zach. You're the best. Um, all right. With that, uh, work plan assignments, updates, and check-in. I don't have really anything new this month, just um, I know Kelly's not here and Jessica wasn't able to come to our meeting about the um, walking tour. We're moving ahead with that. Um, although our nonprofits were hit kind of hard. Again, this has been a terrible year um, with the trees. So we're on, we're on track and we're working with RIT to develop our own interactive map. So at some point we'll be able to share something fun and cool with you to give us feedback on, but we're, we're plugging away on that. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Jamie's not here either to provide an update on the Vietnam Memorial Park. Um, and then I guess, Carol, did you have anything uh, for the Bush Pasture Park uh, like landscape committee that you're sitting in on? Yeah, um, the, so uh, of course it's all been virtual, um, but the second open house and there was a survey posted um, for the cultural landscape and management plan. Um, the results of that are in summary are now available um, <clears throat> from both of those. And those, I can send the link to, well, Zach probably can get the link because uh, it's from the city. But if you go to the city's um, planning page, they have that all there. Awesome, thank you. Um, and I guess just really quick, does, do we have any updates from the preserve, uh, nope, photo contest, uh, like subcommittee, or is that coming in item G, had, preservation month? Oh, I don't know, Patty, do you wanna talk? Carol, Patty. <laughs> Um, I was going to ask. So um, we met was that just last week. Oh, yeah, so it's like a year ago, right? <laughs> what happened? Uh, today is my first day back in my home. That, so, um, <laughs> that was power. Um, so we met, and um, I think we ultimately decided that we would kind of keep the same categories that we've had before, and still deviate between youth versus adult. Um, we discussed some different types of prizes. I volunteered to purchase the prizes if the city of Salem's purchasing policy will allow me to. So Kimberly, you just need to tell, are you shaking your head yes and that um, I can? Tom's, uh, I've not been in touch with Tom. He's okay. out of town. So I think because of the storm and everything, everything's weird and delayed. So he should be back next week. Okay. So assuming that they can, then I will purchase it. Um, we kind of came up with some different ones like to try and mix things up a little bit. Um, some of that was me. I don't know how many of you spend time on Etsy, but it's something I can spend hours on each day. So I spend a bunch of time on there myself looking for some cool stuff. Um, that's either photography or historic preservation related stuff like that. So they will be a little bit different. Um, and then kind of similar to what we tried to do last year, when we do gift certificates, we'll try and focus on small um, businesses that are more local um, as kind of a way to kind of offset some of the losses that they've suffered as a result of COVID. Um, now, probably a loss of power, perhaps being destroyed by trees. I don't know. It's just been a crappy 15 months at this point, people. Um, <laughs> so we did that. So just Kimberly, whenever you want me to just tell me, we'll, I'll do whatever I need to do for that. And then I think um, we, the only other major thing in, if I've missed up, oh, I think Carol might be off, but correct me if I'm wrong. So ironically, um, there's actually supposed to be criteria by which we have judged photos in the past. Um, and Carol and I agreed that we don't really do that. <laughs> and so we've recommended that we kind of get rid of that. Um, um, because if we're not going to follow it, we shouldn't, we kind of kept some general things like, you know, does the, is the, is the content there? Is it generally appealing, but things like, you know, it's sharpness and it's, you know, exposure, like, let's be real. We're not looking at that. It's just, Ooh, I like that photo. Um, so we kind of morph that and Kimberly and, um, Zach, we're gonna kind of help us reframe some of that stuff. So I think, did I did I get it all? Did I miss anything? Uh, just to kind of expand on that last point a little bit, I um, have a, a draft that I'm gonna send you um, the, the sub small committee, whatever the word we're using <laughs> for that is. Um, 
uh, I'm going to send you that tomorrow and the form for submittal is already created. Um, so as soon as we're good on the language, um, we are good to publish. So we can open it next week um, if we're ready. So. That's a ton. That is awesome. Thank you. That's great. Any other uh, work plan updates or check-ins that we want to go over? All right. The only, the only thing I would mention for our new commissioners, and maybe not tonight, but um, we can send them the list. And if they're interested in assisting, we're going to we're going to do an orientation probably next week, and we can share that with them then. And so they can sign up for stuff and things. Uh, yes, please. That sounds great. <laughs> Good. Awesome. Uh, and so with that, uh, legislative updates, looks like we had something in our packet. Yeah. So again, I will share my screen. Can you see now? Yes. Yes. Okay, cool. So yeah, you had some information and thank you, Tracy, for sending me all those wonderful links. And Eunice is also, she left, but she's also our representative to the committee. So the city does have a, um, uh, an official committee uh, and we, I, I won't go through all the code, but you're not required to um, provide input, but if you want to, you can provide input to this committee. And so these items are related to historic. And so um, the, the first one, HB 2123, that's related, it's pretty straightforward and simple to um, the historic cemetery date changes, making it easier for more cemeteries to qualify for, for funding, which I think is a good thing. And then um, the big thing, which can be sort of confusing, is our special assessment program, which is run, it's a state program. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, um, it is an economic incentive program. It doesn't provide grant funding and it doesn't freeze your taxes. It, it doesn't eliminate taxes. You still have to pay taxes if you are enrolled in the program, but it caps them at a certain rate so you can reinvest that money back into your property. So the program itself is scheduled to sunset um, I think in 2023. And so there's a couple different bills in place um, and SB 156 and House Bill 2447 are just going, they don't make any changes. They're just extending it through 2028. But at, uh, Senate Bill uh, 108 is the one that has amendments. And the, the biggest change that caught my eye was um, there's, they're eliminating uh, residential through uh, 2031, which, which means that um, right now residential properties are eligible to enroll in the program. And we in Salem, about half of our properties that are enrolled are residential. So uh, um, that caught my eye. And uh, re again, regarding your alternatives, you don't have to do anything uh, if you don't want to or you can direct staff to uh, either write letters of support or letters of opposition, which we can then forward to Salem's legislative subcommittee. So I'm gonna stop sharing so you can see each other. Thank you, Kimberly. Uh, awesome, are there any questions or comments for Kimberly or any discussion that we wanna have about um, any of the legislation proposed this year? Commissioner Kurtiman. That one that you mentioned that excludes residential, um, I mean, that kind of caught your eye and yeah, it sounds pretty significant if over, over or just about half of Salem that utilizes that is residential. So is, is there, I feel like that that's an easy one that we should jump on and maybe oppose unless there's something I'm missing. Is there like a, another thing coming through that'll take its place or, or anything like that? I'm sorry, I'm just not familiar with that one. Uh, yeah, I sent, um, I was waiting, I was hoping that, um, that SHPO, so this is supported, this, this one eliminating residential is supported by the State Historic Preservation Office, and they've been working on an FAQ sheet. Uh, right now, I just have that email from Chrissy that I sent that you should have in your, in your packets, which kind of goes through it. So if you wanted uh, more time, um, I don't think that the committees, uh, I asked Eunice, I don't think that they're we have a little time, I guess is what I'm saying. So you can, if you would prefer, you can take a little time to, to um, look it over and maybe we'll get more information about it. Again, you're not required to take any action, but, th but it's the SHPO that's requesting that change. And I, I'm not clear why either. 
Yeah, just to elaborate on that, it's uh, Commissioner Ponce, I'll get to you in a second. Um, it looks like in Chrissy's email, she says they're working to develop a more inclusive, accessible, and useful incentive for residential properties, but did say, please stay tuned for that. So that's a really good catch because there's a lot that if the change that's like a positive, like, yeah, that's good. Why aren't you already doing that? But then it's like, you can't, you know, especially for us and not where we don't have a downtown Portland essentially. Um, so, so yeah, that's a, a good, a good catch. Commissioner Ponce. So question on uh, the 50%, what, what, range of number is that? I mean, uh, oh, it's not, it's not enormous. So in Salem, we have 18 properties that are commercial that are enrolled in special assessment and 18 enrolled that are residential, but, but still for us, that's, that's a pretty significant 50, 50. Well, it, it is. And I would think maybe there's some, uh, some middle ground in there with uh, maybe a proposed an extension to the current one until the proposed one um, comes into play, you know, that might be a, uh, which is what those those other bills are doing is just extending what's there but again um yeah commissioner kurdeman yeah i second commissioner ponce that was kind of my inkling too is i didn't see next steps in chrissy's letter so that's where i was hesitant so uh yeah, there, especially with cultural resources and any kind of historic preservation we get a lot of you know, oh, don't worry, we'll, we'll figure it out. And then it's always the first thing that gets removed if budgets are constrained or staff time is constrained. So it's a little unnerving to see them not having um, any sort of protection moving forward or, or, or uh, direction for us and then asking if we're okay with it, so. Yeah, absolutely. Are there any other uh, questions or comments, discussion about the legislation this year? Commissioner Fuller. Um, the, the historic cemeteries legislation uh, uh, struck me as particularly interesting, uh, especially considering that um, Oregon was so you know, exclusive to people of color, exclusive against people of color, um, you know, up until the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s. Um, are there, in a Salem area, um, are there uh, historic cemeteries uh, of color? Um, I'm, I'm new to the town. I don't, I don't know this yet, but, um, you know, is this something that we could, you know, start promoting or, or moving on soon? I don't know. Yeah. Kimberly. Well, we do, we do have two historic cemeteries, but the, uh, they're not exclusively for um, people of color, but there are people of color um, within the cemetery that are buried there. So, uh, and, and, and I can send you some more information. Again, the Oregon Black Pioneers did some wonderful work here in Salem at our Pioneer Cemetery. And there's a really cool uh, monument that they put up um, about it. So I can send you more information about that. But um, in regard, going back to the legislation itself, I'm not certain whether or not this legislation would benefit anything within the city, city limits specifically that I, I'm not, I don't know. I don't, okay. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Good. Great. Great. It wouldn't right. hurt that I'll say that, <laughs> but I, I don't know. if it would hurt. hurt. Yeah. I mean, moving it up from, from 1909 until what would that put it at? Like almost 1930. Um, yeah, I don't do math well in my head. Yeah, it's like a rolling day I'll of say, 75 okay, years, right? Rolling, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be that would be excellent. Um, so I, I love cemeteries too. They're one of my focuses in school. But yeah, thank you. Yeah, and Kimberly's probably tired of talking about it, but of course the Chinese American uh, shrine and, and all of that history that we have in the Pioneer Cemetery and others is very cool. It's definitely something Salem has has fully embraced, which is wonderful. Any other comments, questions, or discussion? So I think, um, you know, I, I kind of agree with Commissioner Kurdeman and Commissioner Ponce about, I think we should make a statement regarding uh, Senate Bill 108, um, but I think that should come after the FAQ because I, I want us to make an informed and uh, fully knowledgeable statement instead of just kind of coming out. Um, so Kimberly, if that's just something you can keep on our radar uh, and maybe sure. we can move that to the March discussion to have a, an action item and a, an actual motion on what we want to say. Great. Um, we'll do. 
hopefully that captures it. Um, let's see here. Next, uh, we have the local event update also included in our package. So I, I don't have a beautiful screen to share on that. This is something that we brought up at our agenda meeting and we just wanna make sure that we're trying to do as much as we can to support the local nonprofits. And so uh, I think that, um, and, and if Carol's here, he can also speak to this, but what we can do um, at your direction is just in your packets every month, we can try to share what's going on. And then maybe Andy can share through social media. It's just, you know, as you we've talked about more than once tonight in particular, it's just been a really hard year. <laughs> and, and we want to do whatever we can to, to help. And I think I even put in the handout that it's part of one of our goals to, to, you know, help get the word out about what's going on and educate people about history. So I don't know that there's really anything for you to do, but also if there's anything you're aware of and want to share, that might be, I mean, we could do that as well if you're, if you're wanting. Are there any questions or comments on the local events? Commissioner I think Zimmerman, it's, I I think it's a great meeting. idea. Um, the more information that we could put out there, I think it's going to be beneficial to folks that look to us, you know, whether it's on Facebook or Twitter or what have you. Um, so yeah, if, if there's, if I could get like a list ahead of time, or if we could somehow have a calendar on, on the, uh, the city's web website, I don't know if that's feasible at all. I think that would be fantastic too, just for folks to kind of say, oh, well, this is what's going on instead of maybe just going to a specific groups like uh, web page or their calendar. If we had kind of a, uh, a clearinghouse, so to speak, where, where folks could get that information or even if it's just kind of amongst ourselves, so then we can just, you know, funnel that stuff out there to folks that who that we know are interested in that kind of stuff that would, you know, attend these events or, or can spread them by word of mouth. Yes. Thank you, Commissioner Zimmerman. And thank you for taking uh, Facebook by the reins, man. I love to see the, the posts. So thank you. Yeah. Any other uh, questions or comments, discussion on the local events? Uh, the one comment I would have, I noticed some of the events do have a fee associated with them, um, like some of the Willamette Heritage Center and Oregon Historical Society talks. Um, and I don't know, Kimberly, if we could just look into if there was a way we could provide uh, maybe with some of our CLG funding, um, or if the city has a pot of money, if people who are interested but just can't afford the $30, um, especially given you know everything that's happened economically in the last year, if we could have some type of fund that we, you know, they wrote an essay or, they, you know, I don't know what it would be, but um, that we could try to make that accessible yeah, to some individuals. Yeah. Ooh, and good timing, because we could, we could include it in our CLG grant. I think so. I'll ask Curry. I think so. We can do that. Okay. And then I would, yeah, we'll follow up on that. Okay, cool. Thank you. All right, hearing nothing else on local events, uh, we will move on to May's big local event, Preservation Month Plan Updates. So our little um, subcommittee briefly talked about Historic Preservation Month. I think we just wanted to make sure this was on everybody's um, mind and thinking about, again, what we might want to do differently this year than we did last year. Um, and I think that one of the things that we talked about was um, doing the presentations of the awards kind of following in line with what the mayor's been doing. and and taking pictures out on site and being able to hand people the award. And then at our virtual meeting, assuming we're still meeting virtually by then, um, that we would just share a picture of that outside in-person event. So uh, wanted to just get everyone's feedback on that and see if you're all cool with that. Um, and then if there's any other activities, I don't know, it's just, <laughs> that you can envision that would be fun things for people to do. I mean, we're working right now with, um, again, the representatives of the nonprofits on putting together uh, both a paper map tour, we're updating our sort of walking tours of Salem and also having, um, that's the, the update I gave earlier that Kelly's been taking the lead on. And our goal is to have it done by May. So that might be a fun activity that that people could do during Historic Preservation Month. But again, sort of like the local activities, if you can just be thinking now, I know it's February and early, just be thinking about what you might think would be fun for folks during May. 
Yeah. If does anyone have any ideas off the top of their heads? So, Mr. Kurtiman. Um, I was just thinking, any uh, fun digs that we could get going, in this <laughs> Kimberly? It's not October, Jessica. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, let this one be for buildings, Jessica. <laughs> we can dig in buildings. There's technology for that. I wrote it down, Jessica. You're in charge. <laughs> oh, I, I don't know about that one. <laughs> See, that's the trick. If you have the idea, now you're in charge of it. <laughs> well, now it's just going to be a sandbox with dinosaurs in it. <laughs> awesome. <mind>. So <laughs> Great. <laughs> uh, Commissioner Ponce, then Commissioner Mulvihill. Just to... Uh, um... With the recent events on uh, the trees, local trees, um, we have a few significant trees in the city. Um, if if they were damaged or, or you know maybe they're they're a loss, I don't know, but um, it might be nice to um, I bring a little focus and attention to that resource that either survived or didn't survive in a replacement or some something like that um, for me. Yeah, that's wonderful. Commissioner Mulvihill, then back to Commissioner Kurtiman. Um, So in my city, before we relocated here for Historic Preservation Month, we used to have a, um, this might sound weird, but we used to have a cake contest where you um, made a cake in the shape of a historic building from your town. Um, and, you know, then you would judge them. And I don't know if that's even possible because of the pandemic, but just something long-term. And then um, my city didn't do it, but um, a neighboring city um, to mine to try and get kids interested in it. They used to have, um, it was either like, a, they could they could recreate a historic building from downtown. So some of them would use Lego, some of them would do like, like um, Play-Doh projects, some would just do art and we would just display them as a way to get the youth involved. And we would work with like our local elementary, they would work with their local elementary schools. Um, and I don't know if kids, hopefully all of everybody will be back in school by then, but it could be, you know, an interesting project to try um, and get them in that we could, you know, put on our social media, the city of Salem's Facebook page. It might just be something a little bit different, um, but those are things that um, I did when I was in the Midwest. I like thinking how I'm going to stack my cupcakes now to look like the Reed Opera House. So that is awesome. I love that. Commissioner Kurtiman. Uh, it was just, I was just going to say, I, I really like Commissioner Ponce's idea um, about highlighting the trees and because by May, I'm sure everyone's just going to completely forget about this ice storm because, I mean, not to be uh, pessimistic, but uh, something else might happen between now and May that uh, takes our, <laughs> I know, right, that takes our, our attention, but, um, and maybe it's just because uh We've we've in our house we've been reading the, the what is it called the overstory the book on yeah you know, trees and it talks about how old growth forests do really well in wind and ice storms because of this protection of outer layer of trees and anyways um but then now I have to say I really like the idea for the kids um, the Legos and the play doh and everything so if if we don't get it done by this may we should definitely keep that in mind so i can drop my kids off thanks <laughs> yeah i think going uh, to the tree thing i want to say we added a little bit more on landscapes and trees into our preservation plan and code so that might be a a neat way to tie in events historic events as pge told me every time i checked their website historic storm um, along with kind of our new code and our plan. So um, that would be a really interesting thing. And, or they could make a tree out of cupcakes. We can have all three. So are there any other uh, discussion items, ideas? Kimberly, one thing I thought of, um, because we did just have a new updated preservation plan this year, um, and maybe people just don't know May is preservation month, um, I would be willing to see if I could present at neighborhood associations, if someone would be willing to help me find that. And I would even be, if other commissioners wanted to participate in that or, or take their own neighborhood or, you know, however that be, that might be a good way to get out. Um, just do a quick 10, 15 minute, you know, this is who we are. This is what we do. We're not scary. Designate your neighborhood kind of thing. Um, Great idea. Yeah. So in, in May, so 
Cool. Yeah. Uh, any other discussion items or questions on Preservation Month? Commissioner Mulvihill. I just have a question. It kind of relates to the photo contest. Kimberly, is there a list of cities in Oregon that participate in the photo contest or do the photo contest every year? I can ask the State Historic Preservation Office, or we actually have a little listserv. Um, I can ask that question. I don't know off the top of my head right now. The, the reason I'm thinking in terms of trying to generate support for those of you that don't know, um, I work for an organization where essentially a sub-department of all 241 cities in Oregon, and it might be something that we could play off on our social media site. Um, so I tried to do a quick Google. It seems like the cities of Redmond and Forest Grove do it at least every year, um, but it might be something where I could tie into my professional life and we could um, almost kind of make a, a contest out of a contest for lack of a better word, kind of like, you know, Which, who was the best in Redmond versus Salem versus whomever okay. um, might be something to kind of gin up and, you know, kind of get some more stuff, but I would need to know what cities do it. And then I could pitch it to my communications director. Cool. That would be awesome. Great. Yeah. Okay. Good. Idea. All right. All right, not hearing any other discussion items. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna add, so before we go into the Historic Preservation Officer Report, I'm gonna give everyone a, a heads up, um, either add an agenda item 10 or in the meeting and everyone uh, stay on afterwards. Um, since we do have two new commissioners, um, I think it'd be great, uh, Jessica poked me on the chat, uh, to do some introductions. And so I think if we all just kind of wanna, you know, who you are, maybe what neighborhood you live in, where you work, your background, uh, it doesn't have to be anything long, um, but um, either after the meeting or uh, again, before we adjourn. Um, so just, sorry, Kimberly, no one's gonna be listening to you now for your preservation officer report because they're gonna be thinking about what they're gonna say, but I wanted to give people a heads up. So, oh yes, Commissioner Kerneman. Um, if, it's, if it's okay and if we can, it'd be great to do it kind of after the meeting when we're not recording it on YouTube, I would prefer. I was also thinking that, but with Lisa. Thanks. I was waiting for Lisa or Zach to give us some guidance. So yeah, if everyone's cool with it, uh, aka Lisa, Zach, and Kimberly, uh, we'll end the meeting. And then if we can all kind of stick around um, and just do some quick intros, and then we'll make sure everyone else, uh, Kelly and Jamie, uh, next month get a chance. Uh, so I will pass it to Kimberly for a historic preservation officer report. Well, we were talking a lot about trees. So um, yesterday I drove around um, to kind of take inventory. I've just got a couple of pictures here, certainly not all the pictures um, that I have, uh, but the, the bush house is on the left of the screen. And thankfully uh, the tree that was on the house itself was removed and uh, best as we can tell, no serious damage. Um, but that, I don't know if you've, if you've been by, you, you've seen it at Bush's Pasture Park, it's pretty um, devastating. And then this other picture on the right is actually a tree uh, that completely toppled over at the Capitol. And the archeologist in me is quite excited <laughs> because uh, in that under the, it's all, always such a like opportunity to do really cool uh, investigations and there's, some brick under there um, and Tracy was the one, it was, I think it was Tracy who told me about it, yep. And so uh, Nancy Nelson with uh, State Park, she's the State Parks archeologist. She's following up on, on that and she'll be out there. Um, they have to replace that sidewalk, which you can see was lifted up. And so she's gonna be uh, monitoring while they do that to see if there's anything else under there. So maybe more to come on that, but um, uh, anyway, so it's not, I mean, it is horrible, but it's not all terrible. We might learn something like at least from this one. And from my uh, brief drive around of the districts, um, it could have been a, I mean, it's bad, but it could have been a lot worse. I, I didn't see any really significant damage to um, uh, houses within the districts um, that, that I was able to see. And in fact, uh, there was one house, I think, uh, on Mission, the north side of Mission, right across from, um, right next door to the Gady Hollow, um, where a tree had fallen and the way it fell, I mean, um, it split in such a way so that it completely missed the house. It was like, wow, <laughs> what a miracle. So it's, it's hard, but I'm trying to be grateful during this difficult time. And that's all I have to share. 
Awesome. Thank you, Kimberly, for uh, being out and about. Um, are there any uh, questions or discussion items about the officer report? Commissioner Kurtiman. Thanks, Kimberly, for looking at the root wads. That picture made me super excited, and I was definitely squinting, oh. trying to see what was under the root rod, root wad. Oh, so I can see pictures if you want, Jessica. Oh, I would love, I would love to see them. Uh, yeah, it's it's definitely been hard hard driving around Salem and not being a looky loo at every root rod, root wad you yeah. drive by. Oh, yeah. so. <laughs> I know. There, and there are any other uh, discussion items or questions? All right, well, thank you, Kimberly, as always, for an awesome uh, officer report. Um, before we adjourn, um, I just want to say uh, I had a little meltdown before the Zoom started recording and most of you logged on, but I just want to acknowledge um, that this last week has been, you know, one other thing added on to, as Patty said, a really rough um, year, 15 months. Um, I know we're, we're really trying to go forward, you know, business as usual, business as normal, we can keep doing it, um, but it's not normal. And I think, you know, if anyone needs a break um, or needs to talk, you know, I'm always here, um, you know, please, please reach out to your fellow commissioners or just, you know, give yourself that self-care and that time, I'm kind of saying this also for myself, um, you know, to, to relax and rest and, and we're all here and you know, this isn't normal, maybe it will be the new normal, but right now we're all still adapting. And so just, you know, everyone, please take care of yourself. Um, Patty, I'm glad you're back in your house. I hope, glad Jamie has power again. Uh, you know, I, I hope everyone else braved the storm uh, literally well. So I don't know if anyone, uh, I just wanted to put that out there, I guess. Um, any other uh, items that we need to discuss or questions, comments? Commissioner Mulvihill. Just a question so I don't forget. Zach, when do you have to have my article for the newsletter? If I have a hard date, I will make it because I'm going to put it in my calendar right now. Um, I will give you a hard date right now of um, March 9th. You should have said much sooner, but okay. Okay, March 5th. That's not much sooner, but it's sooner. You should feel free to lie to me. Um, okay, I'll get it done. Thank you. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Well, hearing uh, no other items, we will adjourn. Again, stick around uh, 